Well, I can remember back to when I was around the age of five. Um, Both of my parents were drug addicts and alcoholics. Savannah Parview had a painful, unimaginable childhood. And I started being sexually abused by a neighbor um, when I was around the age of five. At the age of nine, her father became disabled and her mother's drug problem escalated. And she started prostituting herself um, for her drugs and doing anything she could to get money for it. So I would go with her sometimes when she was prostituting herself and I would wait for her. But then there was a time when I was 11 that her drug dealer offered her a $10 piece of crack for me instead of for her. And so she told him that that was fine. And so then he took and sold me to other people. Sometimes they would take me to hotels. We went to one hotel, like the same hotel a lot. And at that hotel, um, the staff there were friends with my trafficker. He would take me and leave me there. Then the staff would open up the door and let people in so that my trafficker didn't have to stay. So they knew what was happening. And then I remember one time I was there and I'd been there for a couple of days and the staff came in and told me that my friend called, who was really my trafficker, and um, he wanted me to walk home. And so I was walking through the hotel and I was 12 and I was bleeding, I had bruises, I was crying, I didn't have shoes and nobody ever asked any questions. I missed a lot of school because I couldn't go to school if I had bruises and stuff. And I wanted to go to school because I was safe there. And so like, I remember in eighth grade asking my teachers for detention so that I didn't have to go home right after school because I never knew if he was going to be there waiting for me. And my teachers would let me stay, but they never asked why I didn't want to go home. No one ever intervened despite all the red flags. When I was 13, I watched my mom and dad try to commit suicide on the same day. And when my mom did it, she told me that she hated me, never loved me, and never wanted me, and that's why she wanted to die. And after that, that's when I was taken to foster care. And um, I started cutting myself because I wanted to know what it felt like when they cut their wrist. And after that, It was like anytime I got upset or angry or um, just I was hurting, I would cut myself and it would take away the emotional pain. The self-harm escalated, leading to several trips to the hospital. I started breaking my own bones um, because the cutting wasn't enough. But then the staff would use that even if my trafficker hurt me or they hurt me they would say that I did it to myself. Then I was eventually placed in a group home that was a residential treatment center for kids in foster care. And when I got there, the staff um, that worked there were actually friends with my trafficker. So I continued being trafficked while I was in foster care. There were people who came to buy me and they realized like what they were doing was wrong and that like how young I was. And they tried to help me. Um, They tried to get my trafficker to stop doing it and they threatened to go to the police. And I watched both of them be murdered. And I was told that if I ever told anybody I would be buried next to them. For Savannah, the threats and the intimidation and the trauma was constant. And then I got pregnant twice while I was being trafficked. And I was given an abortion at a clinic and by my trafficker, which has resulted in having to have a full hysterectomy a couple years ago. Well, I didn't feel like there was any hope. I wanted to die. My name is Erica Pinheros, and I'm the program director at Catholic Charities Dice of Venice. You know, I've heard her story through many individuals throughout the past five years. Um, And what what I've seen in our community is that people want to think that this doesn't happen here, that it doesn't happen to one of our American citizens. Um, So her story just reiterates that it could be anyone. It could happen in any neighborhood. It can happen um, to a child. 
The statistics back it up. Human trafficking cases are growing year after year with nearly 900 reported cases in 2019. Those are the cases we know about. In our program, we have, I think, over 65 clients right now. And every voice, you know, sometimes they're not ready um, to talk um, themselves, but then we can become that voice for them. Catholic Charities Anti-Human Trafficking Program is the voice for dozens of human trafficking victims in Southwest Florida, providing food and clothing, transitional housing, medical and dental services, counseling and mental health services, legal help, a bridge to community agencies and social services, transportation and education. It's a lengthy process and everybody has their own type of recovery. You know, what success means for one person is completely different for somebody else. Your help can provide anything from basic toiletries to help someone who has just been rescued, grocery or gas cards to help people with food and transportation. But the biggest need is finding each person a safe place to live. But then we get into the, the bigger uh, expenses, which number one is always gonna be housing, which is why we got into transitional housing. Rent is expensive, and we're looking at, um, let's say, $1,200 a month. One of the things that irks me the most is that we're putting um, survivors in places where it's back in the area of exploitation. Because if you look at $1,200, what are the neighborhoods? I, I would like to up that rent and, and no, no longer be in the minimum scale, because the minimum is going to get you a poor neighborhood where you know, they're going to be re-traumatized. If we are able to pay a little bit more and we can put them in, in neighborhoods where they actually have a shot. COVID made it harder. Many of Catholic Charities clients work in the service industry. When COVID hit, their jobs were lost. At this type of work, it's crisis mode. It's immediate. You don't have time to try to figure things out sometimes. When you get a call in the middle of the night, what do you mean? You need to have a plan in place. So I want people to understand that because of COVID, I'm sure it affected even the people that I'm, I'm speaking to right now. But take that and look at the people that were already vulnerable. Look at the trauma that goes behind it. Look at uh, the sense of hopelessness. It's like, I was finally doing well, and then this happens. Savannah understands the short journey from hope to hopelessness. My mother came back into my life um, in 2013. I guess supposedly went through a detox program and was doing well. And so I went to visit her because my aunt made me feel like I had to. And I walked in on a drug party and was gang raped by seven people and sold online. And at that point I felt like my past had repeated itself and that God made me to be abused. That changed when her niece was born. I wanted to be part of her life I ended up spending a lot of time with my high school guidance counselor um, because I didn't want to go to class. And she spent time with me and she started taking me to church with her. Um, she has two kids that are around my age and eventually I went to live with her and her family. That's what, I don't know, saved me, I guess. They encouraged me to go to school, I ended up graduating and going to college. Savannah started seeing a therapist and began talking about what happened to her. That connected her with other victims and made human trafficking a subject that can no longer be ignored. Because I didn't know anybody else that experienced anything like it. Like I remember even in foster care, I wanted to know somebody who had been through the same thing or something similar and was doing well, because I didn't think it was possible. Savannah's been a survivor for seven years, is now a nationally recognized speaker on human trafficking. She helped lawmakers pass a new anti-human trafficking bill and was there when the governor signed it into law. It's like, I wanna be the person that I needed when I was younger. God's allowing me to bring, um, like using my story to help others realize that they're being trafficked or that they were trafficked so that they can get help. It's now her life's mission. It happens more than we know, and it could be happening to somebody you know. And unless we talk about it and spread awareness, it's going to keep happening. It doesn't take a lot to see somebody and ask them if they're OK. Um, if you see a situation, ask. 
ask or just report it um because you never know what's happening and and i mean that something as simple as that could save somebody's life <laughs>